That sounds good. So recording one on an OBS studio. We've got a voice recording here. Uh, we've got the camera here, which is a separate old cell phone, and I've got the sharing of my actual screen on the computer uh, so I could see myself as well. Are you guys sure about... I, I hear a little bit of echo. Is that okay on you guys on the other side? I, I do hear the echo on my end. Let's see how we minimize that. There's a voice input. Uh, is the phone using the microphone too? I try to shut it off, but it's not not shutting off. Um, so the, that's what oh, I you, expect. You're muted. Sure. I'm muted on there. Um, um, and the cameras can pick up audio as well. But on OBS, there should be one designated mm. audio uh, input. <coughs> Does anyone have headphones I could use? Possibly that would be. Yeah. That would help it. Let's see if that fixes it. Recording is on. How about now? Yeah. Now we're good? Yeah. Except because now the mic doesn't work. I can't use the, the mic. The, the oh yeah, sorry, I think the headphone... There's a pin here for headphones. But okay. Yeah. Um, how is the echo on the other side? Is that acceptable? Can we go forward or do we need to troubleshoot it? I think it's still there, but it's, it's I'm willing to accept it. Okay, let's. You I do hear it too. Other headphones. If they have, if they have voice built in, do they, do they have voice? Um, they do on Linux. The drivers are kind of wonky though. Okay. The yeah. Let's. I think we can. Let's go forward right now. We're burning daylight. Okay. Um. Let's see, if I mute, if I go all the way down, is the 
echo any better? No, it's, it seems to be something about the second camera. Um, <laughs> but then I don't want to get rid of that one. If you turn down the volume on the phone, is that... It's just a normal iPhone. Yeah. You use all the way down. So you just need a third camera, basically? I wanted to get the video on me. But what happens if I go a little further? Did that help anything? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's let's go forward like this. We'll try to improve this. Um, okay. So yesterday we went oh, we just got a big kind of overview. You can watch the video that's actually up right now. So you guys can review that. Uh, I sent a link to the uh, YouTube channel. It's just the OSC channel, which is um, on YouTube. Okay. So let's dive right into today. Let's let's really focus on the house as far as the design principles in it and how you can access all the information about it because there's actually a few years of development on it and starting all the way from the micro house one all the way to the full genealogy to the current Cedica Home 2. We talked a little bit yesterday about how to organize information on the wiki such as the genealogies page. So what I'll do is, uh, since my screen is getting shared, I'm going to go to how do you find all this info on the wiki. Um, to review from yesterday, let's just go to the page called taxonomy because that is uh, a lot of this in work around here is around how do you find information and manage it when you have let's see what I can do here I can then they can't see my page um, can you guys the way you can see it locally is if you go into my shared video stream so you can see what I'm looking at in the screen. So the same thing you guys are seeing here and the remote guys, because the monitor here is picking up a different, uh, different screen and let's not troubleshoot that right now. So on the wiki taxonomy there is a few basic principles that we go by and like an open hard, open software, the main principle is uh, modular breakdown into many many parts. So everything that, in order to, to succeed on a large complex project, you have to know how to break things down effectively, create break, work breakdown structures, and then allocate roles to them. And that's how we can solve problems. That's the whole idea behind solving large problems with large teams in a rapid fashion. So first thing to note is, is the idea of module-based design. You can look at more about that. Um, as far as the, the core of the Global Village Construction set, there was the 50 tools. We know that they each have a name, they have a very unique name, and there's a formal name list What, as far as if you want to find any piece of information on any given project. Then we can also go to the development template, which the point number five there, development spreadsheet, but for every single machine we have uh, a whole template, like for example, for the for the CD go home, you see those 22 critical items, okay. And on the left hand column is a description of the item, like what what is that item like, and then the link to the work product. So every time you start with requirements, you want to that's whenever you take on a design project, it's, you can design just about anything until you start confining it and you confine it by requirements and so forth. So you go uh, starting with requirements, you go to industry standards which are what people have done before. Like what don't start reinventing the wheel, start by doing what what people have done before. There's conceptual design which now you start reifying the the requirements into the full technical detail. You start by concepts and concepts could be as simple as a back of the envelope sketch, it's discussion between people, it's other things that exist elsewhere uh, that you can find. 
but once again the key is document that all so that you when you come back to this project there will have been people if we're working as a large team there will have been people that have thought about it a little bit and the key, the key here is that critical item of time binding, the idea that you record the information in a way that's accessible. So don't think, like when you discuss something, don't think, oh, that's not important, I'm, that's just my thought. No, record it. And then, then you have a paper trail left where you can start where the other team left off. Because otherwise it's going to be, once again, that, that mi minor reinvention of the wheel, you're, you're thinking about things that others have already done. Now it's important that you do think for yourself and you, you evaluate concepts independently, but the trick to, to collaborative design is that you, you work with others. So never never do it alone. Like try to expand your mind all the time to include what others have thought of. And that's, that's the idea of documenting things. So you go into module breakdowns. Uh, when you're des designing a large project, break it down. If you have a team, don't start developing yourself. Break it down into little parts. You can break it into modules. You can break the modules further into parts. You can you can break down the parts further into parts that makes make those things to, down to materials. So there's so much on the breakdown front that you can do as well. And then, so once you have the parts that you can re realize as a build, uh, you can start actually doing the CAD. This that gets into the technical design. Now. How do you know that your technical design is any accurate or good? You have to do some calculations. That's point number six. Uh, calculations will, will reveal to you basics of structure, performance, and various things that, that are involved, whatever system you're working on. If it's electrical, if it's mechanical, structural, thermal, um, you can get all those insights from calculations. That's one way to, to feed back into the design that you're actually doing to see that oh this is actually real this is not just something I drew up out of nowhere so so then we continue other things are if it's an ele electromechanical device you have electronics uh, if it's a some kind of a hydraulic thing including a house which has got plumbing you can have wiring and plumbing everywhere just about you have software uh, from the brick press to the tractor that might be automated in the future or, or the software that is used to design the tractor even uh, but software typically refers to the software that you run, uh, but it could also mean the software that you use to, to develop something, like maybe we're developing the house now, but we're also uh, developing software to, to design the house even. Well, but that would probably be more of a project of its own. According to the concept of module breakdown, you want to break things down into as many different, different ways as possible. So that would actually be like, say you're developing the software for a house, a house designer, that's going to be like your own project. So set up a whole development template for it, um, which would be more a software template. It's not necessarily this kind of a template. This template is this development template is dedicated for hardware. But if you are doing software, then maybe. Oh yeah, we fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but we're at, we're not getting power. Oh. Close. Uh, are we? Do we have power? Then? Sure. sure, we got power. Okay, looks good. Yeah. Looks good. Okay. Um, so this is a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we just plugged in a mic into the the camera, and I think that fixes the echo. Excellent. Um, the development template we're talking about is refers to hardware typically, but if you break off into a, a software project. A lot of these items still apply, like which of the ones we have discussed so far apply? Well, yeah, requirements, surely, value proposition, industry standards, conceptual design, module breakdown, 3D CAD, that wouldn't apply. Calculations, I don't know if that applies, but, but in the software that you're developing, you, you can still have calculate, maybe include that there. Electronics, not really, not wiring and playing. But uh, a tip, this is a standard development template for for product development. There's a page called Open Source Product Development on the wiki. Uh, open. It's called OSPD. You can learn more about the overall development process if you're not familiar with what hardware development entails. If you have the pro a product development process, the literature says that the latest and greatest on it is collaborative, open, modular design. So that's what we do here. 
Okay, going on, just explaining a little bit more of the, the development template. So you've got then the build materials on item number 10. We do a special one, which is the visual bill of materials uh, for many projects because that helps with a very easy way to, to, co to represent complex things in a visual way. So for example, if you have a whole hydraulic, this is a whole hydraulic diagram of how you connect wheel motors <coughs> using the actual parts that are actually clickable. Here this is a hydronic control panel or distribution for the water system. You can actually click on each part. The, the parts in blue refer to things that actually have hyperlinks. So you can do these visual types of build materials which are very good for rapid learning. Anyone who can see a picture Picture is worth a thousand words there. So that's VBOM, visual BOMs. Uh, there's CAM files and manufacturing files. Once you have, say, the brick press and you want to cut it out of steel, you, you generate files from your FreeCAD model. Um, basically, two dimensional files that are sent away for fabrication. You got cut lists. You want to document a cut list. Like yesterday, we were working on some cut lists for the, the CD Go Home wall modules. Um, on the build, that's the next phase. So Going back to the main, main phases, you've got design, you've got the bill of materials, you've got the build, you've got the life cycle. Uh, on the build, you start with build instructions, which are step-by-step -step procedures. Fabrication drawings, those would be things that you can send away to a, a fabricator. Exploded part diagrams are very useful. If you have a big design, you can, you can show, like you see maybe like in a product catalog, typically you have the explosion of of say a washing machine to all its parts so you kind of understand it. Um, and then production engineering on the build. Production engineering refers more to, okay, now you're getting into production and you want to get everything optimized. So you, you document exact tooling, workflows, workshop layout, how you, how you do everything. Visual workshop is you know, the latest and greatest than I would say is the visual workshop where people have uh, basically like self-informing workshop layout where everything is clear and visually marked and easy to access. Um, okay, then we go to life cycle design which is um, now getting data. So now we're using this. So we, we built it, we get data. Life cycle design. So uh, build pictures and video. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to catch everything here as we go along. Pictures, just take pictures through the process. Uh, when you take pictures, they they help you. For example, down the road, it's five years down the line, and you don't know what you don't even remember what you did. Well, the picture will remind you right away how the thing was made. Or especially if the thing is closed up in the process, uh, you you can't rip rip apart a finished build. Take pictures in the middle of the build so you see what's inside. So build pictures are very important. Data collection, now you're getting into performance data. Say you built the tractor, you want to see, okay, how fast is it going? How much weight can it carry? Just simple things or more complex things. Thermal performance of the house, how, how fast is it losing heat? Uh, and then you can compare that to your, for example, uh, your calculations. If you did simulations on thermal analysis using FreeCAD, which can be done with, with open foam and FreeCAD. Uh, things like that, data collection, you, you're reifying that which you've, you've built and, and perhaps theorized about in calculations or simulated in calculations. And then future work, typically you want to say, oh, okay, we found out these things, this is what's next. For example, in, uh, in a 3D printer, which just Ken, Ken and I were working on it, we took the D3D Universal, the small printer, and we said, hey, future work, let's make it printable on a D3D Universal itself because the base, as we had it, was way too big. You, you needed a 12-inch printer to build it, and the universal only does six inches. So the future work, we said, okay, let's break apart the base so we can print it on a universal because it's, the parts are now no more than six inches, and we broke down the base into three parts. Great, uh, but d document the future work. Like uh, As you build something, what emerges for you as, as the thing that, okay, this is a, from the use perspective, or needed functionality. This is what emerges as what we want to do next. And then troubleshooting and repair, that would be the guide guides for how you do that. Uh, if you build something, you want to help others document, okay, like what are the trouble trouble spots? That's like entire manuals can be written on that. And here we don't have we don't have a troubleshooting and repair guide for the, the CD go home yet. Uh, we gotta build it for the last, latest iteration. 
Um, this template I mentioned yesterday is implemented by a, a development template. Very important. It's a reminder from yesterday. How do you <clears throat> how do you set up one of those templates? You have to start a blank page. Oh, I just want to show you this real quick. How you create one of those templates? Really, really fast. Uh, the template notation on the wiki is double brackets, so you do, it's called actually subst, which means you substitute that template in. The template is called dev plus. Regarding templates, search in a search box on template, and you'll see what I'm doing here. But dev plus is the name of the template, and pipe symbol, so you pass parameters. In a template, you can pass a parameter into a template. So for example, my project, this will see the project development template for my project. This is the result. I did that in one line. So you automatically generate the whole structure of how you develop a project. So that's very powerful. Now you can develop projects without getting lost in them. Because the problem is what happened on the wiki a long time ago is we set up the development and then you get into trouble once the version 2 comes in. Because what you have to do like in software you really gotta clone the whole project in order to start developing because some parts are gonna change, most of it may remain the same. So in order to, uh, with this hardware bit, in order to keep track of the whole project, just start, as soon as you get a new version, just start a new development template. So uh, we did my project, but I got version two, uh, V2, start a new one on a new page once you get to that point. This is a critical learning for so this is now my project v2 um, critical to, to get that kind of organization that you document keep the whole project together because once you start the, say you want to start working on version 2 within that first project which is what people did on a wiki like if you don't have organization um, then you just start confu you don't know which part went with which project and, and then the documentation pretty much becomes useless because you don't know what com what goes with what is that the current thing for that project or not um, etc so there's a development template and and because we're into open enterprise development we have another one entire whole one called enterprise template uh, that's also got about 22 items or so uh, but that gets into the other aspects of okay here we've developed the the designs over the last decade at OSC, now we're really focusing on this template, which is enterprise. So you've got things about product, production, marketing, sales and support, improvement, you can go through that, that's just standard procedures. Um, so that's a bit on wiki taxonomy that's very important. So this will help you find, and version. Important, important thing about versioning, when we upload files to the wiki, they do have a version history, you can read about that. There's controversy from Holger there. <laughs> read about the discussion there compared to software and others. Um, that's a bit about taxonomy. Versioning on, uh, well, just to show an example of what versioning is about for, for files, if you go to, say, the CD Go Home, uh, you go to, this is the CAD, uh, we, we go to any file here, so this is now looking at the CAD, uh, you take a look at this a module, a complex module like say a window here, uh, this window, but if you take a look at wall module 18, what you see here is a version history for the file. The proto protocol there is click on this file and this is what you get. You get download it, you can see all the old versions, but you can upload a new version of this file and that's what you want to do. Always upload so, you, so you're continually developing as a large team. Okay, so Having said this detail about the development template, the question is, so let's get right into the CD Go Home. How do you find all the information about it and get oriented, learn, learn up on it as quickly as possible? Yeah. The thing to do there is you might want to start. So we have this development template. Important thing is conceptual design. Yeah, by all means, start by looking at, okay, what were the kind of requirements that we did and so forth. But you can study this in detail. So. Um, the conceptual design, uh, we have a bunch of information on, on what the concept was. Details, like part by part, how do you, how do you design the house? Uh, then somewhere in a conceptual design, you want to have what, what we're 
we've generated so far is a des whole design guide, and I don't know if we have that right here. Design guide, we don't have that here, but there is a des oh yeah, there is a wall module design. You know, yeah, yeah, it is there. It's it's um, in the design section of the documentation. You do want to link to design assets because because it's all about teaching people how to design more, not just taking taking our Is my video still going uh, on the remote? You guys are good? Okay. Um, on the design side, the unique feature for OSE is like, unlike most projects, we teach people how to design. So, so you're left with a generative set of information, not only the construction sets, uh, not only modules and construction sets, but also design guides. That's like the most valuable thing because that allows you to generate anything at that point. Uh, you're not going to rely on what we have done. You can now start designing and understand how we designed it so that you can do everything. And we have uh, the master work that we're going to be working on this over the next six months is the house design guide. How do you design it? We'll contribute to it. I mean, there's, there's a good working doc that started, and it's got quite a bit already. So you can learn everything about all its subsystems. The table of contents will, will take you to all the subsystems that we already have. Um, so, uh, but in any ambitious project, you want to start with perspective and the why. Like, what, what does it mean to be solving housing? That's how we start our design guide. We're not just saying we're going to just start some random house. We're going to start with solving housing. That's a worthwhile problem. And here it's all about defining worthwhile problems and starting to work on them. So if you want to read about uh, solving housing. This is some thoughts on what we think it means. But this guide here, it's, let's see if, if it's open to edit. So in the sharing settings, you typically go to, uh, anyone on the internet can find a comment. So, so it's public, you can view this, but uh, since this is kind of a, a pretty decent document in terms of its final state of development it's uh, it's not closed for public it's not open to public editing so the only thing you can do is comment but the thing is as we go about this since this is a more final guide we still are going to update all the parts of this and this includes just about everything in the most nutshell way possible how how you design a house so process overview we start with collaborative development process. How do you not only develop it, but develop it collaboratively? You gotta start with the house modules. What are all the modules that go in a house? General considerations. There's a core utility module that we have. Um, how do you design a bathroom? How do you design electrical? How do you design a kitchen? How do you design for earthquakes and winds, high winds? And how do you design an off-grid house? Uh, then we go into admissible tooling. How do you build it? What are the tools you use? Then we get into Rosebud, the, mod, the current model that we're developing. We go into the actual build, foundations, doors and windows, panels, sill plates, so forth, all the different elements of it. Uh, we talk about modular open source design, how the design build system works. Grow home, that's a big concept. The idea that the home is not only a house, but a growable house, one that's designed for easy expansion. We actually are designing that right up front. Like, for example, yesterday we talked about a hidden door which is built into the existing wall which allows you to expand to the second part of the house once you are ready for growing your family or needing more space. Um, then we talk about, here's the architecture documents you need to submit to the building department once you're ready to build it. Uh, utilities, there's a, that's like the... Structure is one, but the utility is kind of the more complicated part. So we got electrical, plumbing, uh, fire codes, heating, cooling, photovoltaics. So the black stuff is stuff that doesn't have much content. The, the blues might have some some content. So here's an yeah, you know, just everything down to the landscapes, and then we actually get into okay, what machines do you need to to build the house? So take a look at this. What we have already. Um, just skipping skipping through this, we we try to discuss how how you go from the very basics of the modules like Lego right? how do you build this entire house what are all the different variations you can build just to uh, like for example um, 
this little picture here is the expanded version of the CD Go Home that we're doing. That's got the back on it. This is now uh, 50 by 30 by 30 plus the, the garage. Uh, so here it's just, okay, that's Rosebud right there, but the big deal is make any of these things. And they're, they're all going to look different and be quite unique, and you can put all kinds of final trim on these to make them look uh, quite different from each other. Here's going through the everything, all the details. We do a concrete floor. Um, let's view the whole thing. Just skipping through. Uh, the modular design, <clears throat> I mean, this is it. It's like building blocks of a building. You've got a foundation and a floor, you've got walls, you've got windows, doors, you've got a roof, you've got a kitchen. Uh, those are basic building blocks, and it's really not that complicated. You've got a foundation, you've got your walls, you've got your second story platform. If you don't have a second story, it's effectively you've got your foundation, you've got your simple walls around that, you put on a roof. The roof is flat, it's very, very simple. Here we detail the roof, what the roof looks like. Um, uh, utilities uh, and throughout this we emphasize a lot utilities and details about that we emphasize the simplicity and the design the systems design right up front how do you design for an efficient build and the difference there is uh, so let's point at three things so for example our bathroom module you can design the bathroom systems wise to be super simple and it's just to show you kind of the reference of what it looks like uh, but there's ways that you can do it. okay so that's the minimum viable product bathroom we have that it's a module that the way we designed it and it's actually the cat of it um, you can design the plumbing uh, the main utilities in many different ways we designed it in such a way in that very compact design such a it's it's a difference between a, like a five hundred dollar job and a five thousand dollar job design it with intent of how where it is in the house how you lay out the whole house so so we're not just saying okay we're going to build a house maybe the utilities like the bathroom are an afterthought we're saying no we know that that's a pain like we've built a bunch of it right so we say okay next time okay the utilities oh, man that's so painful and you gotta <laughs> it takes forever or whatever uh, so we say let's let's minimize that and then we came up with what right now is like will cost us like 500 bucks uh, same for electrical there's a I'm gonna go to uh, go straight to the <coughs> just give you another example of electrical the utility channel so in the modules uh, actually that's this is uh, under the, the build instructions under the wall modules design guide okay so I'm going to point out to the utility channel because once again for the electrical the industry standard is you you've got your framing and then they drill holes in each single stud to run the wires through it. It's like man, you're going to drill a hole in like just about every single stud in your house just to put in the electrical? How wasteful. So we say, <laughs> well, cuz we're building it. I don't want to do that. And once again, it's the idea that we're the designers and builders and users, so we try to do it really efficiently. So we said, okay, well, let's forget that. Let's do a utility channel. No drilling, and here's how we do it. So, so let's just actually look into that, because that's, that's a big deal. It's like, once again, the difference between a $500 job in terms of labor and a $5,000 job in labor. So which one would you rather have to get the same function? The answer is very simple for us. So... Um, let me let me just point to the, that detail. Um, so I should have an index on that. Do I have a utility channel? Yes, uh, slide 53. Uh, so the utility channel is simply that we leave the bottom of a panel open, and the way it looks, uh, this is it. This is the the bottom of a panel. So you here here see the side sideways view of a panel. Just keep the bottom open and throw all your wires in there. So that way you can actually put all your electrical boxes into the panel already at the panel build level. And then when you got to put all the wires in, you run them from the main electrical box through this channel, you close it up, done. There's no drilling and stuff like that. So you can read more details about this, but I'm emphasizing this once again. That's the difference between $500 and $5,000. How about the roof? We've got a flat roof, EPDM, that's this rubber roofing membrane. It's flat. It doesn't have any other complex truss structure 
um, makes it efficient. Once again, the difference between a $5,000 roof on the same home and a $500 roof for the EPDM. It's, it's literally works that way. You have to say, okay, what are your design considerations? Now, the design considerations that we took up front, the requirements, the lowest cost, most efficient to build, easiest to build, swarmable or doing by pros, DIY or industrial production. That's it. The best house in the world with crowd design. That's our requirements. And then we go about solving that. So getting back to the development template, yesterday we were, you know, we were going through a kind of a fire hose of information on all the house design. But uh, what I encourage you, if you want to find any piece of information here, really study the, the development template. Okay, Like what are all the elements of the development project? And so, for example, just now I, I talked to you about how the wall modules are, are designed with the utility channel. Where are you going to find it? Well, we actually found it here in the build instructions because uh, it may, may not need to be there. It might have to be like in a conceptual design. Maybe we need to put it there. Under conceptual design, we've got... Um, yeah, so the point is that this, the wiki, uh, so this is an invitation. This is, um, okay, you've got all these assets in the development template, right? What if they don't belong there or maybe, you know, just move, move things around? Feel free to organize this as we need. Uh, this is, the wiki here is editable, so you click on edit and you can, that's not where you edit actually, that's the development template. But um, you edit right in the, in the particular assets. So if under the build instructions, we had the wall modules design guide here. Well, I don't know, that really, that's the design part. That's why do we put it back there? There's a reason why we put it back there. It's because um, we had the concept of the utility channel um, at, at the point of the, the conceptual design, but then we actually got to the build, to building it, and we redid it and we re rethinked it, and we were actually starting to build it already. And then we said, oh, okay, this should actually look like that. So we ended up putting it in the build instructions when we were at that stage, and we never ended up going back to conceptual design to put it back there. Um, but what I would do is right here, uh, what do we have about a utility channel in the proper place, which is the concepts? Uh, well, we don't really have that. So that should definitely go in there. And, and once again, I encourage all of you to, to kind of try to get into this. And once you get a handle on what all the assets are, start rearranging them. So I'm going to go like right up here. Um, I mean, that really belongs in a, well, <laughs> right there, obviously, right? We've got the other design guides there. So feel free to edit it. And um, there may be a lot of different examples where where that kind of uh, organization is needed. Each of these assets are to be developed. This is so this is um, what what test driven design is. It's iterative development. Test driven design means that we we build and test. We go through that cycle over and over again, and you can do that infinitely. If you're a software guy, you know how many bugs you fix and how many times you have to go through it. It's actually the same in hardware, which makes hardware a thousand times more expensive and harder. Like harder, it's about a thousand times harder. In terms of expensive, it's probably a million times more expensive if you were to go through the process. So if it's so expensive, you want to get smart about taking small parts and just iterating on small parts. Don't like build a whole house and then fix the toilet and build another house. Uh, just develop the new toilet. <laughs> Stuff like that. Uh, that's test-driven design. Just break down the, the project into as many parts as possible. Uh, work on solving those. But here everything is going to change and evolve and improve. That's the, the whole deal. And we're trying to get the, both the remote community and on-site community to, to make that happen. Let's go into the 3D CAD because that is um, ultimately um, just in, um, in all the assets that you have, you can have all the different ideas, requirements, concepts, industry standards. We may or may not follow industry standards. Industry standards for a house are, for example, to drill through every single stud after you build the house to do the electrical. Well, maybe we say, forget that one. We do our own. So, you know, you study it, but then evaluate it. Is it the good way to do it or not? Concept, uh, calculations, um, all kinds of design. Out of the design phase, the rubber hits the road. The reality check is the 3D CAD. That's what you're actually going to be doing and building. And at the 3D CAD stage, 
there's a difference between just a concept CAD. Like when you have 3D CAD, it doesn't mean it really belongs in a 3D CAD. Um, we put it there, but it could be a conceptual design in 3D CAD. So that means you model it in a simple way, model something in a simple way, but it's not a technical design. So you have to understand is that 3D CAD actually technical design or not? And and the way it's the only way it's going to be real effective design is if you've done some calculations, you considered buildability. Like for example, you're at the build phase and you actually found oh you got to do it different, then you you're going to reinvent your CAD. So highly iterative. The the most important asset in the design phase is 3D CAD, uh, and then there's a a whole. Uh, the, the way we treat design is that you have to be able to rec reconcile the CAD with a bill of materials. So for example, if you're doing a CAD and you haven't considered the actual part you're going to buy or make, then you have to go back to your CAD. Like go to that. That's why an effective process would be to say, okay, I'm going to start with the materials I can get. That's one way to design. That's actually how we do it a lot. We say we know we have easy access to all these materials such as this lumber, or the steel or parts, electric motors, stepper motors, rods, and so forth. Start with that. Don't just don't start doing your CAD, like drawing ra random stuff. Start by, okay, this is the material I'm gonna use. I'm gonna do the CAD for it. Therefore, this entire CAD project refers on I'm gonna search all the kinds of repositories out there for existing CAD and looking at more at the bill of materials than at just starting CAD from scratch. That's the kind of uh, accountability you have to have at the end of the day. You're going to be using parts from, from various suppliers. Unless you're making them completely. Unless, for example, you're 3D printing them in which any geometry is feasible, pending certain printability constraints, and so forth. So, so the bill of materials always has to reconcile with the 3D CAD. Then you're going to go, go to the build instructions, and the build instructions better reconcile with the 3D CAD. Yesterday we mentioned about constraint workflows versus moving and rotating things into place, which we prefer for accountability because if you constrain things and magically put a bolt through a hole, it doesn't mean that it's going to fit in real life. So do that level of accountability, go through the build instructions and then go back to your 3D CAD and see, okay, is that bolt really going to fit into that hole? Can I move it in place? Um, and and your so-called merge workflow, Google that, not Google that, but see it on the wiki, merge workflow with moving and rotating things is sufficient and gives you a level of accountability for buildability. So when you design, you have to be thinking, I've got this part and I've got another part, can I move them together? You have to think, think about build instructions at all times when you're doing a 3D CAD. And sometimes when you get to the build instructions phase, you say, you think, okay, I really considered the intricacies of the build. Now my CAD doesn't make sense anymore. I really got to change this because it's so inefficient to build. You're going to want to do that if you're the builder. <laughs> uh, if you're not the builder, you're not going to do that. That's why a uh, big claim here is like if you disintegrate the process of design, engineering, build, purchasing, or use, if all those are not integrated, you get inefficient design. We get a hundred thousand dollar house that we can build, and that's why the next guy can build our house for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's the difference. So you have to integrate the entire flow from finish to use, and then to to life life cycle use as well. And we add on top of that the collaborative design process, economics, and saving the world while we're at it. <laughs> so that's it. So we, we think about the bigger picture in this. With the uh, so the build has to reconcile with the with the CAD, and then in the life cycle design, once you're taking the data, uh, that also feeds back to naturally to to what you're going to build and how you build it. So you might end up that. You know, you, you were great until the build, you're actually building it, and then you took some pictures. 
and then you found that someone substituted some parts. So, so maybe, you know, the build pictures and video, the data collection will tell you, oh, okay, I actually got to go back to my CAD and fix it and the bill of materials because we actually ended up using something different that only emerged at the, the data collection stage. We never caught it. So that's why you want to do data, data collection. And it's, and the feedback loops is the critical part. That's how you have lifetime of improvement with open source documentation, a product lives forever because you can improve it over life. And that's the idea of time binding, the idea that humans have the unique capacity to build upon former work. And that's why collaborative design can be so powerful. And that's why we have a complete advantage over anybody who doesn't do that, which is the rest of the world where with proprietary design. There's a huge advantage to this transparency and and feedback loops that allow everybody to contribute back to it, pending the fact that they can find it. So the organization is critical, the information infrastructure to make it happen. So there's another document I want to point you to. This is a meta design guide. So how do you design? Uh, we get to down to the level of how do you design design guides? Okay, meta design guide. So here we talk about what are the critical things um, that you want to put into a design guide to make it useful? So I would say that the design guides plus enterprise models would be some of the most important assets that we generate. Uh, right now, say we're working on the house, but the ultimate product is a house design guide. How do you help anybody design more, design different versions? And we do that naturally by the modular construction set approach and we can take it a step further formalize it and, and write a whole design guide on, on how you use all those parts to make that happen uh, so the concept of design guides is important talk about here the different uh, well the, the collaborative aspect and then this CAD BOM build reconciliation and that's what I emphasized with the development template is that uh, when you recognize that it's like Tetris building blocks um, the free CAD the breakdown the modular breakdown all the parts the bills and materials the build procedures all have to reconcile but that's uh, the implication there is that large teams can work collaboratively the bill of materials is not a separate project from doing CAD and doing instructions. And in fact, all those things can pretty much be done simultaneously if you're smart about how, how you go about it. Definitely, if you have a design guide, then you're on the same page of what parts you're using. You can even say these are admissible parts, parts that are proven to work. Because the thing is, there's so many different variations of everything out there. Um, because, I mean, that's an artifact of a non-collaborative society. Everybody makes their own thing. Um, and then, of course, there's standards. But right now, by and large, there's like a thousand different wheels you can get for a car and stuff like that, right? Um, but if we're trying to say we've got a collaborative process, well, let's design the optimal one. <laughs> and that's, that's a big thing about... Um, the possibility of an open process, you can design for the optimal. Like if you talk to an engine guy, they're going to tell you there is no optimal diesel engine, right? And Jeff, you understand that. Uh, anyone who works with diesel engines will know there's no, there, like one has good features and another one doesn't. So why aren't we optimizing for the best? It, that's how society works. We're in a stone age where things never get to be the best because everyone's got special interests. It's non-collaborative. So there's a potential for a great shift in that, and that makes life easier for, for everybody. Um, that's just a better way to go. Uh, I got off a little track on, on the design guide, but I do want to show, there's, besides the, the design guide, there's... Um, Let's see, there's the the page with all the design guides is called the I always see design guides. Yeah. Can I spell? 
design guides. So in 2021, we added the house design guide. We've got other ones, and there are various forms of completion. There's the meta design guide, which I was just describing. That's how you, the elements that go into making a design guide, but also the collaborative design guide. Like this, this is a, that's not the meta design. It's a different document actually, but this document talks about how you design collaboratively because that's a different thing than if you're just designing. And in it, the big focus is um, this, I want to, this, this CAD BOM build reconciliation thing, uh, kind of make a big deal out of it. But, um, because the central question is collaborative design is how do you get people to do, like how do you eliminate those bottlenecks that everybody can find a good role? Well, uh, part of that here is the, so there's the CAD, BOMs, uh, so the CAD is the free CAD symbol, the sh shopping symbol is, is the BOMs, the bills and materials, what you actually buy, and then the modular breakdown or, no, build instructions, sorry, build instructions, Tetris, that's how things fall together. Uh, the, the fourth thing actually is icons. So for visual communication, we talk about how do you also represent, because making diagrams, diagrams, how-tos, they're a big thing. How do you communicate information rapidly? And pictures are a thousand words, and then videos are a thousand pictures. But for icons, that's another whole set of things. And why do we put it there? Because then you, you include the design and visual arts community in that. And you can start integrating that with the design process. Like if you have a, a bill of materials or, or like a diagram of a design, why not also have ready to use icons that can be used to help you in the design process. And for the icons to be really useful, we have um, the pattern language. So how about if we represent common objects, common products, common machines, all the stuff we do with simple to understand icons where you can have an assembly of those icons that actually correspond to, to parts that, that are in it. So you can educate yourself on it. And we started this page here, it's called Pattern Language, Open Source Technology Pattern Language. How do you iconize and, and basically represent things? So for example, a car can be represented by something like this. You know, and this is an old one, like we, we got to update these, but there's definitely frames, there's wheels, there's power, there's power, there's fuel, there's controls and things like that. But the idea of um, these icons is that you can make very useful um, design. Once again, the, each icon should correspond to a bill of materials part, it should be real. Uh, but that's, that's the thing about collaborative design, include the people that do the graphics work in it so that at the end of the day there's the shipped product that's that's the goal um, well, let's see what are some of the the main points of collaborative design uh, let's see let's see, view yeah. fit yeah um, it's a yeah for collaborative design it's about okay what are you designing how are you getting a lot of people motivated in order to collaborate with you? How are you keeping track of all the information so that anyone else on a team can find it readily? And that's, once again, gets back into the development templates or the organizations, organization of, of a project. The real live editable group collaboration is a big deal, like using Google Docs or other platforms to collaborate at the same time. And also understanding the process understanding what things are called so it's about okay what the process looks like so that I can find it so in principle any asset on the wiki you can go to going say back to the, the development template you can find for example the CD go home bathroom toilet you know where, where do you find information on it um, under module breakdown you that that should be there like okay the bathroom system that should be there and you should be able to literally type if you know the name of the project, which is Seed Home V2, Seed Go Home, so you got to go back to the official naming convention. Here we kind of break it a little bit. Uh, it's it's kind of hard because, like we call that Seed Home version two, right? It's Seed Eco Home two. Um, so if you know that, the part Seed Eco Home two, you should be able to find all the assets. 
genealogy pages are very important to keep track of all the histories of each project. So we have genealogies for a lot of the projects by now. And for example, for the 3D printer, you can look at, okay, there's all these versions that we did. So under each one, each one of these will have its own development template. So the point is, there's tons and tons of data. Um, there's just basic count, counting, it's like 50 items. You might have 12 modules for each, that's like makes it 600 already. 50 times 12. And then you have the whole development template, which is 22 parts at least. And then if you go to the de development of enterprise, you got twice that. So it's 40 times 50 times 12, you know, 2,000 times 12, like 24,000 items. You should be able to get out at the tip of your fingertips. Now there's many modules, so the 24,000, that's for one, one, one iteration. But you're going to have 10 or 20 iterations or 100. So you're talking very easily 100,000 or a million pages and you should be able to find it immediately. Like, like I want to find out what, what happened on a, on a printer in 2011 where I knew we had this, oh, we were working this cool thing. Okay, great. Your genealogy, go back to that version. You look at, oh yeah, the controller, we did this tweak. And you find it, okay, great. A uh, few seconds, you've got one of the million parts of information where each piece of information can be a page or a hundred pages. So you really got to master how you keep track of it. Because it's fine, you can start doing, you can start going at it and, and just go and develop. But after you're at this game for a little bit, like I've been at it for a decade at this time, and we went through the initial crash of the wiki where it's like, okay, we couldn't version it. So, uh, so you got to make sure you got to, you're starting up a new project for each version, that you're doing the version history within the CAD files, and you're breaking things into modules. So uh, this huge complexity, if you know it's very basic principles of what to call things, how to version, what you're working on as the process, you can pretty much find everything. So, so But you have to think about that. And, but you don't have to reinvent it from scratch. This is all according to generally accepted principles of open source product development, uh, nomenclature, taxonomy. This is very basic principles. We're trying to. We're not trying to reinvent anything here. This is all old news. You can read about it in other areas, such as information architecture, product development, open source development. How the, how people do that, and that way you can start orienting yourself like okay this is the overall development process and I can find any piece of information on it so uh, and I think I'll wrap it up with that basic intro to how to find everything uh, and regarding the CD home um, the, the thing that we're working on right now is the CAD so we're filling in a lot of that and for that that in itself is a game because we've got we've broken down the project into 61 walls wall modules altogether is going to be like a hundred different things because you got to have the floor the roof the landscaping this and that it, it adds up but as you see it's like it's unmanageable un until the point where you just kind of start start thinking about it and then get engaged in a wiki like if you think that's it's not organized properly do it you know don't be shy uh, revisions always can be restored the version history like for this page you go up <laughs> you can view the history uh, don't be afraid about editing. If someone doesn't like it, they're going to edit mercilessly and restore or restore a former version. Same for CAD files. Throw up all your CAD files as soon as possible. That's the only way that somebody else can pick up on what you're doing already. Each version of a CAD file has a history. Pictures do have a histories too. One thing I want to show about the CAD is in order to orient people, because imagine you've got a bunch of people working on this. The concept with a visual history on the CAD, and that's what, that's what we do, for example, the top picture is actually a visual history, like how uh, files have been uploaded or changed. Uh, it's just a little thing that it's done manually right now, but it helps in the overall organization, um, because otherwise you've got these, these things. Um, the icons, the icons really help you visually orient yourself. Like you don't have to actually download the file to know what's in it. So all the time in the part galleries, try to make the picture correspond to the reality. So okay, um, the door window combination there. Well, I'm expecting to find that door window uh, 
well, I don't need that, so I'm not going to download that file. Otherwise, like typically in GitHub, you've got just these walls of files, and you don't know what they are. You got to download, and it's crazy. So here, the visual orientation is important. So is the visual history. Like, do the visual history um, with the latest on top. So you're not like if it gets really, really long, the visual history is useless because you got to scroll all the way down. So keep the newest at the top. Um, same for the cat files it's like here they're ordered um, pretty much module by module one to three through we got up to 68 or so um, 69 and then there's other there's here work on select details so that's a bunch of other files just extracting little bits of the whole design um, so so the, the point is there's a lot 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 of information and the other thing is Nobody in the world does it at this level of detail. For example, an architect just does a general concept. The, the builder, they never draw up the full build detail. The carpenter just does it, let's say. You know. So here we're actually documenting everything. And we must, if we are talking about digital housing 2.0, which is optimized and which allows an unlimited number of people to collaborate on it. That's the important point. And with that said, let's collaborate. So today we'll, we'll do for the group in-house. The, the bottom line is, as I mentioned, the CAD. Like, it's got to be real. It's got to be good. It's got to be verifiable. Yesterday we ran into questions like, okay, I'm, I'm doing a CAD. Well, how do I tell it's correct? Well, that's where you have to understand the design. What goes into it? Understand the parts. So you can reinforce the CAD process through, okay, what are the actual parts I'm using? What are my requirements for it? How do I build it? There's all this then calculations. Tons of information that go into the CAD file, so there's, that's the difference between a BS CAD file and actually something that works and is optimal. So, uh, and it's useful to start getting into the mindset of understanding what file is BS and what file is this is good, this is valuable. Like, get, develop that skill to actually being able to discern what level of quality a file file has, uh, and then quickly you'll you'll notice that out in the real world, um, like a lot of people say that, oh, well, all these designs are out there. Why are you reinventing the wheel? Well, a lot of them aren't, or maybe the crappy ones are. So a person who doesn't have that kind of insight, they're going to say, oh, that already exists. Well, if you look at it and you can see it, you're going to say, no, it doesn't exist. That's not a real CAD file. That's a BS file. So, um, or it or it's, doesn't have detail or whatever. So that's, um, to get good at this, you, you got to practice, and, and then you, you kind of uh, practice with the whole process and integrate the process. The way you can learn as fast is by doing both the design and build. If you integrate that process, you can learn much faster. So for today, let's, um, let's break down into some of the, the design. Uh, yesterday, we went over some of the design principles. But before we go there, let's actually review that. Because uh, yesterday, we were just going over, OK, what does a wall module look like? And how do we know we can design it correctly? and uh, go from there. So let's see. So before we go further, based on this design session, what any questions that, that stand out for you guys or uh, also remotely? Let's see, maybe type them in the chat, chat or see, can I hear you guys remotely? If you guys want to speak up from remote, I got my volume back up. Uh, any questions here? looking nothing is coming coming to mind at the moment for yeah. me yeah it's a it's quite a load of info you can study some of the documents the idea is actually so I mentioned about how do you make this uh, so so we're doing 120 design lessons altogether and in fact it's more because we're really going uh, there's five days a week times six months which is what uh, 20 days a month times six is that's how I get 120 but actually we're gonna go with the collaborative development which is Saturday We'll record a, a session there too because that is really important. That's like that part of how do you involve the whole world in it. Now that's that's huge. So we'll record that. So actually, there's I'm gonna uh, we'll end up with uh, 25 times six, which makes it what 150. So yeah. But in those lessons, we're saying okay, everyone, how do we start organizing this better and better, make it more accessible? So one thing I did think about that that could be very very relevant. I pointed to the let me show this, was the a platform that's it's like a dashboard. 
uh, you can see flashy XM on something we prototyped before, but basically a bunch of windows within the wiki. So, for example, what should go in the first window is the, is the video of the actual me talking, and then maybe have supporting windows where you've got, okay, here's the transcript from Paul, here's the working document, here's uh, the forum, you know, just maybe we could do something like that. Um, so that every day we have one of these uh, flashy XM, that's what we called it before. Extreme manufacturing and flashy as uh, I don't know where we got flashy from. Flash mobs. <laughs> That's called flashy. Flash mobs. So how do you get like a whole bunch of people organized? Meaning you got to onboard them. You got to present all the information very clearly. So in a flashy XM style, how do we communicate these design lessons effectively? What I could see is a page like this. That's a simple one-liner. You invoke this with a template. You pass in okay day one. It sets up all of this for you, and then we can put in the assets. Here's the upload the video, here's our working doc, and so forth. Maybe we could do something like that. That's an idea, but I would like to suggest it because we do want to, we are definitely generating the assets such as uh, the video recording. And is this still going? Oh, that vid my video died there uh, some time ago. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an idea. Um, for today, we're going to. On site here, as I said, the CAD, so let's get back to the, the core work, which is the CAD. Uh, we can do some of that, and the key is to practice, keep practicing to the point that when you ideate something, you can, it's really quick for you to just get it into the three-dimensional model, which in itself is very informative. It, uh, if you can do that process of actually drawing things up, it's almost like doing the build if you use the simple CAD workflow, because you're, you're making parts, you're moving them and rotating them. And that's like really as close to the build as it gets if what you're doing is actually buildable and there's that level of accountability. If you think about it with the, the idea that, okay, I'm designing this, but I'm actually practicing the actual build because I'm gonna build it. It's such a different process than just like jumping on a, a design project and, and starting that like typical people do. So. Um, so you wanna you wanna do the practice to get to the point where just about anything you ideate you can convert into into a, a CAD. And a good metric here for all of us would be like every day we're, we've generated something because it's so, it's easy for us to do it. We should get to the point as a group where okay I've got this idea here's the CAD and we can maybe throw it on a 3D printer immediately or throw it on a torch table and we've got some metal thing that we can weld up. I mean get, getting to that level. Um, and it does start with just getting good at the CAD, which is just practice. Uh, it's just practice. So today we're going to go at some practice of this. So let's take some of the modules that we have, which uh, on the CAD page with the free CAD files, all the red ones are not done. Anything that's got .fcstd and it's red, that still needs to be done. So we'll divide that here and let's do that for the next, you know, we got 940 uh, for the next two hours till noon, we're going to do that. Let's generate one module maybe from scratch or from an existing module that's similar that you understand, okay, I understand enough of the design to make it work. So, what we'll do right now is go through, and yesterday we started to talk about this, but uh, we went through the design of what uh, what is a wall module? What are the critical things? So with the additional insights of today, like, okay, we know there's bills of materials, there's buildability things. Um, there's existing designs that we can study. Okay, let's take all of that and pick one of the, the files. So anything that's, so if we go to Seed Home 2, <coughs> CAD, so how do I know where I'm gonna go to? I'm gonna go to the CAD, 3D CAD. Where do I go from there? Well, that's got a ton of stuff there. Well, actually it's the point two one. That's where we put it, all this in FreeCAD. The FreeCAD is the latest. The Seed Home 3D, yeah, it may be good, but I don't guarantee it. It might be outdated because the latest work has been in, in FreeCAD, which is the ultimate thing. We start with the Sweet, Sweet Home 3D. For the Sweet Home 3D, the critical file you need to get down, and I won't open it up, but you can, um, since it takes forever for me to load it here. But where do you find the Sweet Home 3D master technical file? Who can tell me that? I'm going to go into the index. I'm going to say Sweet Home to part library. 
Oh, I see point number three, Katarina Source Google Drive, Sweet Home 3D Files. Great, let's go there. Uh, you can see all of her work there. The Rosebud Working Model is right there, CAD. It takes you to, when you look at the file name, it says SH2 Conceptual Rosebud Seed A. That's, we've done a bunch of actually different models, so that's, that's that one. But I want to look at the technical one. So I'm going to find it at Supporting Rosebud Files, Conceptual, Technical. Go to Technical, Modules. There, okay. okay, next to last is SH2 Technical Rosebud Seed A SH3D. That's the one you want. Download that one, and you can see the. Re oh, you have to open that up in Sweet Home 3D. I won't do that. You can download that, and you can see what we're doing, and you can hide parts to get down to like here's a wall module. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep at the Sweet Home 3D, uh, keep away from the Sweet Home 3D, go to, to the FreeCAD, but if you have a three monitor system, keep one open and, and one, I mean, it, you're really getting into knowledge management here, so you need a few screens. Uh, you can do it on one screen, definitely, it's not as efficient. I have a three, mo three, mo three monitor system. One is the my uh, web browser, the second one is the Sweet Home file, the third one is the FreeCAD, and you can really correlate that uh, if you're doing this design work, it, that helps. You don't need it um, but it does help a lot. So if you go to, so back to uh, the CAD, the, the free CAD. You go to 3D CAD. Once again to the free CAD. Anything in the 69 parts that is red and it ends in .fcstd needs to be done. So pick one, and before you do that, so I'll, I'll let you do that later, but right now, let's go through a quick blast in 15 minutes of what a wall module is. Just the simple ones, let's not get into the doors and windows, just a simple, simple module. So for that, I'm going to go to, where do I find it? So, okay, so you're working on this, it's after this meeting, where do you find it? Well, it's, it uh, should be under concept because we're saying here's how you do it that's a concept now uh, the only thing is we've got that info let's see do we put it into conceptual design we've got the wall modules design guide sure it's right there so working doc open it up and it, it's, uh, it's it's got a that document's got a lot of info in it it's got a total of hmm, 87 pages and there's an index up front so in an index I'm gonna look at how about well module construction set okay well tells you the process what we'll focus on is there. Wall panel 101, slide 44. We went through that yesterday. And then the index, that should be indexed well. Oh yeah, there is. It's at point 10. Wall panel 101 through 108. This is entry level wall design, uh, like in school. So wall panel 101. Let's go through wall panel 101 through... Uh, we only need to go through page uh, 104 uh, but let's expl explain everything about that because if you do this, you know how to do it except for the corner modules. The corner modules are a little different. So what we'll do is we'll go through the plain wall module, which is very simple framing out of 2x6 US lumber. And then we're going to switch into actually another document and go into what the corners look like, which should be in this document, but it's not. It's in, a, it's in, it's in another one. So wall panel 101. What are all the things we know that you can now say, okay, I can verify this, mo this module design is real and good. You start with, let me expand just a little bit. 
what we know about the whole system is that we're building up 2x6 lumber. Why 2x6? It gets you 5.5 inches of insulation. It's overbuilt compared to 2x4s, which is standard U.S. construction. 2x6s uh, allows us to go up to three, three floors using this kind of system where each panel is uh, 48 by 96 or 48 by 108. No, what's 9 feet? 9 times 12, 108. 96 or 108 inches tall. So two by sixes. The top and bottom plates are all four feet. The middle studs are they're called pre-cut dimensional lumber. They're pre-cut so that when adding the top plate and bottom plate, and you're looking at it from the front, so it's like long way. Uh, this is the sh the thin side, which is 1.5 inches. A two by six is 1.5 by 5.5 inches in the U.S. That's what we're working with. Top plate is 48 inches, so is the bottom, and the middle ones fill in to make this exactly 9 feet. But it's actually cheating because it's not exactly 9 feet, it's 3 eighths of an inch under 9 feet. That's how they make, when you buy a piece of, piece of pre-cut dimensional lumber, it's slightly under, it's 3 eighths inch under the, the mark for various reasons. Therefore this module, at the end of the day, is not going to be 9 feet, it's going to be 8 feet 11 inches and 5 eighths. It's, it's uh, 3 eighths under the 9 foot mark. For the 8 foot wall modules, which are used on the second floor, it's going to be 3 eighths of an inch under 8. So the way the house is designed, it's two story. First story is 9 feet tall, so you got 9 foot ceilings, which makes it nice and comfortable and spacious. That's kind of like <clears throat> decent decent housing. It's, you can do eight feet, that feels a little more compact, uh, but we're going for the high life here. And the second floor is, uh, so actually if you want to save a little bit of cost, you can go with an eight foot floor if you want to. You have to change things accordingly. But the first floor is nine feet and the second is eight feet as it stands. All our standard construction has got four of the vertical studs and top and bottom plate. The spacing, when you work it out, it's, it turns out if it's 48, you've got four of these members that are 1.5 inches, then the cavities in between are going to total 42 inches, or divided by three, it's going to be 14 inches. So each cavity is 14 inches, accepting a standard roll of insulation. So you roll out fiberglass insulation into this. You can use all kinds of insulation. Fiberglass is the easiest, cheapest right here. That's the basic design. On each each vertical stud, you have three screws. I actually draw drawn two here, but there's three screws on each from the top, and we use screws. So the industry standard would be to nail it. Um, uh, we can nail it upon graduation. Until then, we're going to make mistakes. If we assume people that are unskilled building a house, screw it. <laughs> You're going to have to account for making mistakes so for us it helps a lot if we screw things together now at the very end like for example the front panels once we know that they're in we can po possibly nail off things at the very end to make them stronger but the reason for the screws is the modularity and and the fact that if we're going to modify this in the future that's the other reason um, normally you, you nail things because that's it this is expandable housing which uh, the approach of incremental housing so we're designing things like we're using screws because we want to be able to take things apart. I mentioned that we already have put in a door as one of the, like a pre-framed door so that we just take off the panel and put in a door afterwards and we don't have to destroy anything. We simply unscrew the screws with star drive bits. Three screws on each uh, here, three screws on each, each end. Spacing, uh, the cavities are all 14 inches. And the practical thing was uh, what happens in a build phase? What if you have a bent piece of lumber, which you know, lumber twists, is, here's done for emphasis. Um, what you do is screw in one side first to, to fix it, and then you try to twist and wrangle the piece of wood and screw it in on the other side. But save it for last if you've got some good members, and last one, save it for last. But this is the thing that we emphasize that uh, if the reality was picture 44, then this would be super easy but the reality is 45 and that's emphasized 
for to get you prepared i mean there will be some piece like if you have fresh lumber and it's like man everything is perfect yeah you're good but every now and then and that always happens you're gonna have some bent lumber and stuff like that you have to wrangle it and that's that's what can trip up a novice so as long as you know okay i'm gonna screw in one part and then do the other you don't have to give up you screw it in top and bottom if you put the facing the the, the sheeting on it later on then if the middle is bowed you can pull it in and out and now you are back to a perfect panel but that's like that's perhaps like the hardest thing about this whole build project you're a novice a thing doesn't fit I give up <laughs> no you, you can actually make it work and, and maybe like if you if you know that you'll definitely be prepared if you don't you can probably like save all the bent ones for later to get them, you know take them back to the store and get fresh ones or something uh, but that's just the nature of wood. It's not like steel where steel is straight and doesn't warp. Wood will warp and if it's hot and humid It will warp more. So that's how it works. Okay, next part is the blocking. So because now blocking refers to uh, Blocking on top and bottom like this occurs in the nine foot one? Sorry? On the, on the bent one. So it's saying you attach just one side and you leave the other one loose? So attach one side. The point I was making there was don't try to twist it into shape and then attach it um, because you'll keep fighting the other person. Like, don't attach partially. Okay, I'm going to get one screw in there and then you, you have the other person fight it on the other side to get it bent back in. Because that will warp out they will twist out the side that's partially attached so the thing is attach one side fully that's that's the trick attach one side fully and the second side then you can even have the two people try to bend it into place and attach it then uh, it's something that's rather obvious but if you're not if you don't think about it you'd be like i can't get it to fit so it's just a, it's it's rather obvious, but but rather obvious is not obvious to everybody, and it could cause some people to give up and be super frustrated. So um, attach one side fully, then even with two people, wrangle the other side and attach it. If the middle is still bent, don't worry about it, because you're going to put a piece of sheeting mm -hmm. on that. Once you have the sheeting, then you can bend the middle in or out. You know, it could be a couple of inches. <laughs> Not a problem to bend it in because the wood is flexible. Like if if you have something to hold on to, it's impossible to bend if you don't have it attached firmly to something. Because if you try to move it, it moves with you. Yeah. It's very light. <laughs> so the point is, attach it, and then you can move it around into shape. Pretty basic, but that needs to be taught for anybody. Everybody has to learn that. So. The nine foot modules have blocking on top and bottom. Eight foot modules only have blocking at the bottom uh, for the following reason. The panels are four by eight lump, four by eight sheets. <clears throat> so let's go to, <clears throat> to this one, which is the blocking for the exterior plywood. Because the plywood only is only eight feet and the panels are nine, you're gonna have a part that's left open. Uh, and when you attach the plywood, you, you need for attaching, you need something behind it to attach to. And that's why you have this blocking at the top. And the location of that blocking is going to be determined by the height of the panel. The, the panel should be at the middle of that blocking. The only detail you have to remember, and it's in the bottom detail CAD, you can download that. The front paneling hangs down one inch. It's actually 1.1 inch about it's around there uh, one inch about over the front so that you didn't get moisture under the panel that's basically a drip edge so hang it down an inch because that's where all the water is going to be running down the foundation below that so you want to hang that over a little bit not exactly with the bottom plate that will determine exactly where the top top blocking is located for the front. This is exterior plywood. This applies only to the exterior plywood. On an eight foot panel, you don't have this consideration. You're just one inch down off the top of the top plate. 
in an eight foot panel um, for the interior panels you start at the top the exterior panels start one inch down because the the bottom hangs down one inch for the interior panel on the nine foot modules you're gonna hang the interior panel at the top because I mentioned the utility channel on the interior we have the electrical utility channel so you don't want to start the paneling at the bottom because we're gonna keep the bottom open so we can have electrical wires go into the panel start the plywood at the very top location of the bottom blocking is determined by where the panel ends up and if you draw yourself within CAD a 4x8 sheet you'll know exactly where that location is I'm not going to say what it is because you'll forget and I don't remember myself right now. It's determined by exactly the um, location where the interior panel ends. Now, because uh, before, there's another little detail not recorded here. For the exterior plywood, you have the, the blocking in the middle, like the edge of the panel is in the middle of the blocking however on the interior plywood the edge can be at the interior or at the bottom it doesn't really matter uh, but because the blocking right now we're using 2x4 lumber and we're splitting that in half we don't need like this whole whole three and a half inches of it 1.75 inches in half so we, is that sufficient that's sufficient. We rip it on a table saw. Uh, you can use full blocking. It saves you the rip part, but here we're just going to save some money by not not using a full one, which we don't need. We're going to use just rip the 2 by 4s in half. For the bottom blocking, the technical detail there is if you use 2 by 4 the location is not super critical, but it still has to be at the point where you're ending up with the bottom edge of the interior plywood on it so you can screw through it screw the bottom edge in. If you're using the half, the ripped plywood, you only have 1.75 inches. You could do it like down the middle, uh, so you've got like three quarters of an inch, but maybe you can also do it, I actually don't remember what it's like in a CAD, but it's, you can put the bottom edge of the plywood with the bottom edge of the blocking, because nothing else goes into that blocking at the bottom. Uh, just to re verify what I just said, I'll look into the the design doc which was uh, on page where do we have the detail uh, in the index, we've got the utility channel that's uh, here I'm, I'm just looking at the, the very detail so look at, if you look at this detail ah Okay, I'm glad I looked at it because it's actually a little different. So look at that. Uh, so I just lied to you. The, the, the bottom blocking occurs under the panel. So, so see this detail. Wait. No. I'm getting confused. Let me draw that in so I deconfuse everybody, including myself. So I'm going to draw where that bottom blocking is. It's right there. See what I just drew? Um, that's going to be the location of the bottom blocking. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And that blocking is like 1.75 inches. So that's the interior plywood, this pink. The blocking goes all the way to the bottom. Now it doesn't we don't need to do this because this one by two can ride on the studs well actually no. there's a one by two piece of lumber that closes that's uh, that's that's what forms the utility channel there's a one by four lumber underneath that um, we should draw that there's a one by four no, there's a reason for this here. That's, okay, so we need to talk about more details. Um, the panels, 
So for this piece of blocking, devil's in the details here. I mean, it's, it's rather simple, but once you include everything, including the utility channel, you have to pay attention to all the details. We're digital to the point of one bit, like we can only remember one, one thing at a time, <laughs> so we gotta record all of this. Um, and I just forgot about some of these details. So the detail here for the blocking on the interior plywood should be such that <clears throat> it ends up like right there at the bottom of the blocking. Uh, plywood ends up at the bottom of the blocking. One by two lumber we can screw in to the studs that, that are at 14 inches. That's fine because we've got the four vertical studs so you don't need anything behind this one by two lumber you can get away with that piece right there. Now, um, for the interior blocking, um, you don't have to worry about this at this point, but I'm just gonna mention why this is like this here, like this, I thought this would be like to the bottom, but the exterior walls sit on a, on a sill plate, so there's actually one and a half inches underneath this, so this applies to exterior walls which sit on a on a sill plate, which is another piece of two by well, two by six. So that's why there's that space there. So the utility channel, if you look at the, the section from the side, it's actually like this here. Now um, it's a little different. Now there's interior walls too that you have to consider. Uh, so for interior walls. Let's maybe not get into interior walls since that's an, that's an overload, getting overloaded. Because all we wanted to do for today is generate one or more panels. So you don't have to worry about the utility channel yet. We'll cover that. That it's, well, it's details. It's details. The don't have to worry about it right now. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say I'm just looking at like the exterior channel is goes all the way to the bottom, and the interior panel covers the top. Right, that, that's that's what I'm saying. So, and then the utility channel is at the bottom of the panel, just to make sure that it's always oriented in the correct yes. direction. Yes. Yes, that's the concept. And because the <clears throat> the exterior wall panels sit on a sill plate, that's why the utility channel actually ends up hanging down over that, which is not the same as interior wall panels, which do not sit on a sill plate. The sill plate is just the exterior perimeter of the 32 by 16 structure. So there's little details once you get into this interior wall system. Now, when you understand the concepts, you can logic this out. Oh, that's interior and so forth. But you got to understand all those details. But like 90% of the panels or however you want to account it, the, the large majority of it if you understand the concept, you'll be like, oh yeah, they're, they're the same, they're kind of the same, but except for this, this and that detail, which if you're going to build it properly, you have to know all those details and you cannot miss anything because that means like you're recutting things and messing up and adding cost and time to the build. So um, the good news is that they're largely similar and which, which is what makes it possible because in a standard build, everything is like a little different. It's not something that without a lot of carpentry experience you can say, oh yeah, bam, like this. But this is, if you know the pattern, if you understand the pattern, you can replicate that over many panels. And that's what makes it accessible to a, a novice builder. Uh, a lot of people, maybe the carpenters, they would perhaps rebel at this kind of method because they'll be like, this is dumb. <laughs> it's going to take me more time. Uh, it, it could. Time. Take more time um, compared to doing standard panels, but it depends how you account for that time. If you're building a standard house, and say you you know say you got to lay up a simple wall, yeah, maybe the carpenter might get you faster because because uh, if you're building with one person all the wall modules, but you're gonna beat them twelve times if you have. 12 people, or, you know, like it'll be comparable, but the point about this is you can build it in parallel. That is the idea. So they'll, they, they might be like, oh, this is dumb, I don't want to do this, and people have certainly said that to us, but 
if you're designing for a large group build, you're going to blow the guy out of the water. And you can clearly clearly show that. Um, unless you, unless they designed the build for massive parallel work, like Jeff's had experience with 300 person, 24 hour church builds of what, like 3,000, 2,000 square feet or something? Yeah, it's, uh, it seats 100 people. I don't remember the physical yeah. dimensions, 100 and some feet long. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there is... Wide. Yeah, 3,000 something square feet. Yeah, so, so like Jeff here, he, he mentioned about church in a day program, they get 300 skilled carpenters and builders in 24 hours to build a church. We're taking, say, 50 unskilled people and in five days building a house. That's the kind of a, a comparison. So we're getting into the details of utility channel, which you need to know back in the design doc, just the simple stuff that we want to do. Because this is like where it gets hairy, like, okay, let's do one step at a time. We've got a bit of time till the end, one thing at a time. Don't have to worry about the detail of the utility channel right now, as far as how, how big it is, except for the fact that you know you've got eight foot or nine foot panels, and the plywood on the nine foot panels, because on the eight foot panels, you don't have the consideration of the utility channel in the same way with respect to the eight foot sheet. You still have a utility channel, so what does that mean? Got to cut the sheet, and the blocking is going to be also in a different location, not determined by the sheet anymore, because you're deciding where you're going to cut it. Mm -hmm. So, details. So the blocking or, does match up to the eight foot, though, right? Yes, like it, it does. does. So you don't you don't actually need it because it'll just go directly into. On a on a nine foot panels. Because right. it, it's. Just a little bit too long. You have to have the blocking to yes. reinforce it. But for yes. the eight foot, it's just basically goes right on top of. It. You would have to walk at the top. Yeah. Right. You still start at the top, and there's there's more details. We'll cover that later. But just the general preview of that is the bottom plywood. Whenever you screw the bottom edge in, you still have to go into something. You can't go into air because right. if it's unsupported, it will be warped. You have to, in order to keep that wall straight without warping in and out mm -hmm. towards you, you have to have blocking behind it so it's flat against it. Right. Which means that in an eight foot wall module, you're, you're going to cut the plywood if you want to build a utility channel. Now we're actually designing it such that some wall modules don't have a utility channel because it happens that, okay, we, we ended up all the electrical system, there's a, maybe a couple of panels that don't have it but most of them do in which case you're gonna cut down the plywood to a size smaller than eight in order to accommodate about a foot of utility channel and about these details okay and you're gonna have to put the blocking in behind it too right because now it doesn't act exactly match up because you cut it because you cut it like instead of yes. eight, it's seven and then you put the blocking behind it yes and you nail it. okay I'm, I'm now sense. okay so that's the concept we we said that now, in the wall panel 101 through 104 that I mentioned, I'm sorry I didn't include that. So we need to add that. That is an important detail because if you're making the second story panel, wall panel 101 through 104 doesn't cover it because we just said there's going to be that blocking determined at a very particular height. We don't know that until we study the utility channel. So actually, let's not do that. So I'm going to say, limit yourself to the first floor modules and do all of them. Uh, let's let's start with those. For the nine foot, sorry, for the second floor eight footers, we can still um, you can still design. There is no blocking for the exterior, but there is blocking for the interior because we don't have that detail of the channel, which is let's not go there right now uh, just do the framing without the interior blocking for the upper ones we'll, we'll just return to it another day that's fine uh, so if you're taking the the second story panels, which are eight feet you don't have any blocking in there because the front exterior plywood the exterior plywood spans all it matches the front one. 
it matches it, but it doesn't because there's details. There's this, there's the second floor platform that it doesn't match it, but we don't need blocking there. Let's let's not worry about that. You just need the basic, super basic frame for the second floor. Okay. Now, one might say, well, okay, they're going to be primarily all the same except for the corners. So why do it anyway? Well, you still have to do it. Remember, we're still getting a real physical model, 100% digital model. You cannot say just, oh, fill that panel in later. Let's generate it because we were making a complete path, complete model. Um, questions? What's the interior sheet? It's called 3 8 inch beadboard. It's, oh, okay. it's grooved so it's wood. plywood. Oh, yes, uh, that which we paint, which is, uh, industry standard is drywall. Right, right. Which is $5,000 more. <clears throat> So these details add up to why we can go cheaper. The beadboard is cheaper than plywood. Uh, beadboard is much more expensive than well than plywood. Beadboard is about the same. It no, looks I, better I, I than drywall. I thought beadboard was more expensive than sheetrock. Sheetrock is much less expensive than beadboard. Oh, oh I thought you should not. It's the labor and right. the workflow. That's a lot of work. Yeah. So. Uh, that adds up unless you're a you're a drywall guy. Uh, you got to hire somebody for that. Mm -hmm. So if people are that's it's actually a real business question. People are like, I don't want that. I want drywall because I'm used to it. So what do we do there? Well, I would say, well, at this point, I'm not doing it. But you can say, okay, pay five thousand and hire somebody plus materials. But most people just don't know. Like they, they just want drywall because they believe that. A lot of it is that. Then you have to go through the whole like, okay, well this is the benefit of, like on our end, and then this is how it works in the home. And it, it's just yeah. the same thing essentially. Yeah. Better. Yeah, it depends how you define better. If you want smoothness, drywall, you can perfect that. Here, the better is, oh, you can actually fix it or modify it later like that. For drywall, you gotta cut it, is there any consideration it. for a fire rating? Is it there is. Or for code? <clears throat> is they, yeah. Is it okay? It's okay because the only place you're concerned about fire ratings is next to a garage. Now, for which reason, we don't have a garage. We have a carport, which is open to the air. You'd have to do fire, fire rated materials. Not a big deal. It's just a little more expensive. But the way we designed it, it's actually a covered, it's a thing that's actually a uh, a garage is defined as an enclosed structure. Mm -hmm. Our carport is actually not enclosed. It's open from the front and back. So it looks like a carport. It looks like a garage, but it's not technically. Uh, and also allows you to... It's, there's a real reason for it. If you have an enclosed structure, if you got a gas can in there, that's going to blow up. Here with the unopened, the un unenclosed, mm -hmm. uh, there's a real safety issue there. You, know, you don't get into dangers such as like fumes and Right. and things uh, killing you or blowing up. So there are valid reasons. We are using a fire rated door for because that's still required for... Uh, no, actually it's not. We're, we're using one, uh, I think, because for the consideration if we, wanna, if we wanted to enclose it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so we covered a lot of that. Now, we did not cover it. Let's really quickly... Okay, we, we kind of went way more than 50 minutes, but... Uh, these details add up, um, so you, you got to remember quite a few things. There's the other part, the corner modules. So while everything is like these panels that we described over the last 15 minutes, corner modules are a little different because the corners have to address a couple more considerations. They need to be stronger, and because you they have the wall has a particular thickness, it implies that. The lengthy walls, we're making them 32 feet, but the shorter walls, that means in order for you to fit, the, the dimensions of the house are 32 by 16. If you have a wall that has a finite thickness, it's not zero, it has a thickness, that means somewhere you're gonna have to reduce your panel width uh, or expand it to more than 32 by 16. We chose to keep it at 32 by 16 because that's what dimensional lumber comes in and we wouldn't be able to span across it if we went larger. So we said, okay, let's reduce uh, the panel thick, uh, width by a little bit so we can fit those panels on the short side. And so the panels on the short side are gonna be, be 5.5 inches 
shorter to account for the fact that you've got a 5.5 inch wall on the long sides. That's the basic principle. Uh, but how exactly do these corner modules look? For that, we go to the, this document is under build instructions. It's the first one. Under build instructions, you got generic wall module structure build instructions explanation by Katarina. Uh, so click on that. So here, we talk about the details. She, she goes back through what I just talked about here. That's all good. The blocking on the top and bottom for the nine foot panels. Now, the corner panels, there's extra detail. So these are the nine foot main wall corner. Main wall refers to the long side, the 32 foot side, left and right. They're mirror images. They are not identical. They're both mirror images. Now, what we're doing here, for the corner module, looking from the inside, this, is, this would be, let's zoom in on this one. This one here, looking from inside, you see this edge is different. This is a nailing board consisting of a 2x4 piece of lumber sandwiched between two of the other same studs, which are, which are the 9-foot pre-cut studs. So here you've got one, two, three, four, five of the nine foot pre-cut studs plus the blocking, where one of the blockings is shorter, because you've got this extra structure. So why do we do that? We wanna have this nailing board so you can s nail or screw the short side walls into it. You need to have something to screw into, otherwise you'd be screwing into these uh, verticals uh, this gives you extra structure on the corner, and that's a good practice here, because these are corners, they're, they're susceptible to damage, like um, the details come at the corners, the weak corners will make your house collapse, so you got to make sure the corners are very solid. Um, so that is the detail, what, what that means for the CAD is you're going to have a 2x4, which is 1.5 by 3.5 inches in the US, uh, there's a close-up picture, so that this 2x4 is on the interior side, it's recessed in, like you see here, this is looking from the outside. It's recessed in, so you can screw into it uh, looking from the inside. This is looking at from the outside. And there's right and left, because the house has a right and left side. And that's the long side module. Now, for the short side module, it's a little different. We mentioned that it's going to be a little shorter than a full 48 by 48 width. It's going to be shorter by the 5.5 inches of the thickness of the wall framing. So this makes it 42.5, and that should be reflected in a table below. Where is the? Where are those dimensions there? I don't see it, but. Um, the thickness, the length of these top and bottom plates will need to be 42.5 because you're subtracting the 5.5 inch width from the outside um, for the, the long side walls. Which means that your blocking is going to be shorter. You can figure this out by drawing in real dimensional lumber if you're looking at this one, the question is, what is that blocking there? Well, if you put it in there you, and you know it's 48 inches, subtracting and adding will, will tell you that that short piece is actually 8.5 inches, and that should come out in the CAD. You should be able to see that, verify that in the CAD. We know it's 8.5. We had a long discussion about that. No, 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 no. Nine. Sorry. Uh, nine. The nine there is correct. Uh, we had a long discussion about that, whether it's 8.5 or 9. Uh, now I think we're, we're at 9. However, there's a, a detail on this one is that the one, this 9 here, on the short side, we do not believe that's 9. We believe that's 8.5. And you can see that in a CAD once you, the thing we do know 
is that the top and bottom are going to be 48 minus 5.5. We know that we're keeping the ch these channels here still the blocking here at 14 inches because we're making you have to consider that you fit the insulation just like you have before so we're not going to change that otherwise you'd crumple up the insulation and you wouldn't get as ins as good insulating value so we're keeping as much consistent to fit in your standard insulation rolls and then we have to cut down the insulation for this here for the thin channel but the blocking there will be 8.5 inches. How do we know that? Uh, we're saying that that blocking is, we know we truncated the module by 5.5 and we had the regular blocking at 14. So 14 minus 8.5, so, sorry, truncated by 5.5. 14 minus 5.5 is what? Sounds like 8.5. And that's why we say that that should not be 9, that should be 8.5. So there we go. And we were talking about that yesterday. So yeah, we verified that. So uh, so yesterday we were able to kind of verify that by looking at like, okay, so I looked at this table. Katarina drew this up. I said, okay, well, it should be uh, generally design is good if it's self-verifiable. And yesterday we were able to track it down to, to say that, oh yeah, that should actually should be 9 there. But in the other place, it's 8.5. Um, so that's another design principle. Try to make your things so simple and obvious by design that they're self-verifiable, that it just is obvious what it is. Um, and if you, if you do custom design, if you change anything, you have to think about how things work. So, so you have to use some logic in custom design if you do different versions or have some special considerations. But that covers the corner modules. So you can take a look at this wall modules document, which is, um, I'm gonna link to that. That is, here it's a mixture of concept and technical. Uh, so we had, and somewhat of build instructions. So we had it under build instructions, but actually I'm gonna paste that back into the conceptual design, because that's more like concept. How do you figure out? So I'm gonna paste that back into conceptual design. Um, um, I'll call it Katarina's wall concept and that's it so with that we should be able to take any module now and do the framing design it which will be applicable to any geometry of the CD cajon any, by any geometry we mean uh, I'm going to just show you to record this. Um, under conceptual design, we've got variations. This just I wanted to show this. Um, but the idea here is uh, Rosebud model, it's the 16 by 32, it's that thing there. But here we just explored okay, if we have just these uh, four 16 by 16 modules. How many different buildings can you build with it? Well, it turns out about 40 of them. There are like 40 on this page. But if you take four of those modules, that's all you could build. Four, like first one is like four linear. You can do like a cross with a tiny courtyard. You can do a staggered structure. You can do the rosebud there. All these kinds. And a, and a dark means that you have gone up a second story. Now you can probably add like a hundred more if you go to three stories <laughs> um, or however many. Yeah. The point is you can do an infinite amount of variations like for a row house or whatever, larger structure. And by how you design the, the trim on the outside or details such as trellises, patios, garages and things, even though you have a flat roof, you still have a modern looking structure that can take many different forms depending on how you finish it. So this can be quite generic in terms of the kinds of designs you can build with it. Um, so I think that's it. Let's, let's call it a, d a day for the design training. Let's practice. So any questions at this point? Or now we're perfectly clear how to design any of those 1 through 48. Yeah?
All right. <laughs> Let's do it. So take um, any module. Let's, we actually, because we've got a few people here, we started uh, within, uh, the, not the design guide, but there's a cheat sheet, actual build cheat sheets, which would be under the build instructions. So we go to build instructions. We do role allocations at the wall module cheat sheets. So right uh, here, we basically copied people's pictures to next to a module to show that that particular person is working on it. Now we divide this into two sets of role allocation slides. If you look at this, this is role allocation wall modules 1 through 24, CAD. Page 2 is role allocation, wall module 1 through 24, build cheat sheets. The build cheat sheets are a little different. That's actually the cut list. They look like like this. This is where we're actually saying, okay, this is our little build cheat sheet for, for say, <coughs> wall module 1. Okay. So here we go, these are the materials, this is the cut list. The cut list is what you actually end up doing, that's the critical part. This is the cut list, and then you have a build procedure. Um, but that's the cheat sheets that we're working on. So imagine having 50 people doing this, you give them one cheat sheet, they can follow this, here's what you cut, here's what you build. Typically you want to get one person cutting, like our cutting station, so you definitely could do that or if you're cutting yourself you need the cut list but if, if somebody else is cutting then you just need to inventory that you make sure you've got all the right pieces but this diagram helps you identify all the pieces and there's little details of how we connect the modules we're not going to get into that there's little holes we drill on the sides but we're not going to get there yet so so right now pick a module and subsequently put your picture next to this CAD okay CAD so I'm gonna um, since I'm not sure which ones were done, but I know I'm not sure which ones. <coughs> this should be where I guess if this was uh, just in there, I don't think you were doing that, right? Uh, so let's get rid of that. Not, not, not for that one. one. Right, you were doing the build cheat sheet, so that's where. Correct. Oh wait, I gotta I erased it at the wrong one. Mm -hmm. You gotta erase it at the CAD. Mm -hmm. So put your picture next to it and do it. If it's if it's red on the other slide. So go right ahead. Um, so we'll quit the recording right here. That's enough for this lesson. And now anybody in the world can design one of these wall modules from scratch. Recording has stopped. Okay, now Perfect timing. <laughs> who who did who's who was recording?